Greetings from Podcastville. It's Monday, October something. I don't know what it is, 20-something. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by my bookie. Whether you're an expert or you're a rookie, you should be betting at my bookie. You pick a three-team parlay, all right? And if they hit all three, you could turn $100 into $600. And there's a lot of action going on right now. You got World Series. You got hoops, which there was a fight on Friday night. You could have bet somebody getting punched in the face. <laughs> you got everything. But my bookie is the one I bet I know you'll be happy with all year. Do me a favor. Log into my bookie right now and don't miss out on the last opportunity to collect the biggest industry's bonus. Use promo code CHURCH and you'll get your deposit matched by 100%. You understand me? 100%. 100%. That's promo code CHURCH. My bookie. You play, you win, you get paid. Also, the church is brought to you by my favorite, On It. Listen, I just got the shipment. I got my little bars that I take on the road with me for protein bars. I got my uh, uh, Shroom Tech uh, uh, Shroom Tech Sport. I got my Alpha Brain. I go on these cycles for 30 days, and I get off it. And then I go on for 30 days. That's how I live my life. My focus is there. My clarity is there. I'm healthier than ever. Listen, go to onit.com right now and press in. Church. C-H-U-R-C-H and get 10% off delivered to your house. Onit.com slash church. Right there, 10% delivered to your house. Kick this motherfucking mule Lee. A little Sunday night, Monday morning chat with my main dog, George Perez. We're going to Cleveland this weekend. Going to have a good time. So I figured we'd get you in here. I got a few questions for you, and then you go do whatever the fuck you got to go do. You know what I'm saying? What's yeah. going on, George? Nah, just chilling, my boy. You know, I just got back from Paramount. I was hanging out my homeboy Big Sleeps, and you know how I was waiting for today, dog. I'm excited. You got a spot tonight somewhere? No, nah, I'm going to go hang out at the store after this. They got some open mics. I'm going to try to get up, you know? You're doing the store a lot. Yeah, Are I'm you, doing the store a lot. He's got you as a regular <clears throat> or a... Uh, uh, no, right now I'm a development spot, but I still grind. I do all the open mics. If other people are running shows, I try to jump on. Sam Tripley always puts me up. Red Band always puts me up. Rogan puts me up sometimes when he's there, you know? I'm just grinding. Making it the journey that it is, dog. So it's called developmental spot. Yeah, it's a development spot. So right now, like, all the shows that are ran at the comedy store, they put up two comedians before the whole show. We do five minutes each. Then the show starts. That's pretty cool. I noticed that they're doing, they're giving people five, like, to, like from 8.55 to 9. Like, yeah. Like, real short. The, all the door guys get spots, too. So it, it's cool. It's amazing what you've done with comedy, huh? Oh, dog, it's a trip. Like, hey, homie. I was telling these fools, they're like, how do you know Joey? I was like, I met him at Pepper's 2002, 2003. It was somebody's room, dog. And you were out there, and it was just ridiculous crazy. It's been a crazy journey. Fuck. I want to ask you something that I know you thought about. You watched the news and stuff like this. You know, when this Kavanaugh started, started coming up, right, first we have the Me Too movement. Mm-hmm which it's, 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 you know, empowering people and it's pointing to people that have done some fucking crazy shit, especially in Hollywood. Yeah. But then you have this new movement, and I and I appreciate it all. You know, I'm not, I'm a crazy fuck, but I'm not a me too. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, you get your dick sucked, whatever, but you, you don't yeah. need to meet two people or trick people or like that. But then something happened a couple of weeks ago with the Kavanaugh thing. I'm an ex-felon, just like you. Yeah. You know, we both made mistakes. We both did our time. And we moved the fuck on. And guess what? Little by little, we're turning our life around. We're not Straight fucking up. priests. But you're not uh, involved in doing stupid shit. You take the energy that you... Remember when you used to wake up 30 years ago? You were waking up thinking about how you were going to make 50 bucks. Straight up. Whether it was delivering a bag of Coke... Burglarizing fake checks. We used to do the fake, fake checks. checks, the gas cards back yeah, then. Yeah, it's it, it's crazy how somebody could pop up from thirty years ago and say, "Well, George Perez and Joey Diaz did this to me." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And so, what do you want to do about it now? What do you want? What do you want to talk about now? People change. Yeah. Do you believe yeah. that you change? How old are you now? George? I'm forty one. And were you a different? The I'm truth, way fucking Between different. you and I and the, the family of the church, what were you like at 21? 
What was George's world? Fuck. At, at, at 21, if I would have seen you on the street, I just would have been like, what's up, homie? Where the fuck you from? This is Shotgun, Big Bad Orange Gang. Like, that was my high. <laughs> like, 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 when I got introduced to another male, they'd always be like, what's up, homeboy? This is Shotgun. Where you from, puto? Like, it was just like that. What were you doing for work when you were 21? I was doing construction. I was a cement mason. I was finishing concrete. I was making, dog, I was making a thousand a week. Rent was 700 a month. I had my own fucking place. I had my baby's mom. I had, I had girlfriends in every job site that I was at for like three months. Cause sometimes we would rent hotels and fuck bitches at the bars. So yeah, dog. No criminal when you were 21? Oh yeah. Like, you know, I got, I got caught with the gun. I got caught with the knife. I got, uh, I already got a couple graffiti charges and shit. Cause I used to be a tagger before I was a gangster. I used to ride on the freeways and shit. How old were you when you were tagging? 15, 14. And what do they do when they catch a tagger? <laughs> Fucking, they, they give you community service. Like cleaning the walls. You gotta clean all that shit to pay a fine. Then like, if you get caught again, your parents get in trouble. It's, it was, it was in, you know what I mean, dog? It was in. And Were like, you a juvie? Did you ever go to juvie hall? Or nah, I went to juvie hall, but like my mom and dad, my my dad was like, fuck it, leave him. My mom was like, hell no. My mom watched Bad Boys the week before. It was like, they're not doing that to my son. <laughs> I could have hung, dog, you know what I mean? But my mom was like, nah. But I, do, I was in the county like by 19 already. You know, I know what prison's like. I can't imagine what juvie's like. Oh. Like, I never was in trouble. Homie, the juvie. rules are different. But I, I've just seen documentaries and read a thousand books on it. Yeah. Of people talking about juvie. And it does not, your chance, if you get, listen, if you get put in the system after you're 21, there's a percentage of, of, of a chance of recidivism. When you get put in the system, when you're 15, 14, you're pretty much doomed, done, bro. Yeah, done. You're done. Four years with other kids that are just as crazy as you are. And these were kids that weren't shooters, nothing like that. Mm -mm. These were kids that would just smack a cop. Yeah. Don't like, give a like fuck. I grew up with kids that would smack a cop, you know. <laughs> for what reason? For just being To a be cop. cool as fuck. Just to be cool as yeah, fuck. Yeah, like, fuck this cop. You know, like this is you know, like today you hear about these school shootings and stuff that the kids showed signs. Yeah. You know, of, of fucking being a little whacked up. When I was a kid, let me tell you something, I knew what motherfuckers to stay away from. There was a couple of kids I went to school with that dog that were just, you know, out of their minds. Yeah, you knew they were gonna grow up to be murderers. Yeah, something. but okay, so how old are you? Is this the seventies or eighties? This is the seventies. So like a hey, dog, like describe this for me. Is like cause you're in fucking Jersey or New York. Jersey. You're in Jersey, dog. Like, are you walking by Cubans? With like, what nationality? Like, I've always wondered. Like, is every project a different nationality? Gangs, like. Okay, the only time I was really ever around gangs was when my mother had a dry cleaner in the Bronx. Oh. In the late '60s, the gang, fucking thing, was huge. Hell yeah, in New in York. The, in the Bronx, it was huge. And my mother's dry cleaner was on Royal, the Royal Javelin. <laughs> so turf. Yeah. Turf. Yeah. So my mom had to give a piece every week. They were cool. Oh, it's with my mandatory. Moms. That's mandatory. They were cool with my mom's. There was no drama. The Royal Javelins. I still remember their insignia. It was like a Chinese guy with a ponytail on their backs, and they had oh. like, they, they were bikers without the motorcycles. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they, they wore like vests. Okay, like the Warriors did. Like the Warriors. See, like oh, the Warriors. Shit. So you in New York, you had five boroughs filled with gangs. Now, years later, when I started just going to Harlem, I can't lie to you. I heard about gangs, but I never saw them or was involved with them at all. Okay. I heard about the Ghetto Boys. At that time, the Ghetto Boys, like in the early... In 68, I knew about the Royal Javelins and, like, I don't know. I can't remember. They all had, like, weird names. And they all ran three blocks. And okay. I don't even think they sold Nickelbacks then. Like, they didn't know about financing. Yeah, it was know, a whole different. It was different. You know, a gang. Prostitution, like, probably. Like, when I watched Sons of Anarchy and they showed Kurt Cesare's and all the Cholos and when Jimmy Smith came in, if you live in where Jeff Garcia is from. 
Where's he from? La Puente. La Puente. La Puente has like seven gangs in La Puente, and each gang is assigned to a different turf. Uh -huh. And at that turf, they shake down and they finance by selling street drugs. And that's their, that's their yeah. hustle. They make pennies to a dollar. Yeah. But in their world, they're fucking big shots. And that's the social economic. That's what it is. That's what mm -hmm. it's created for. So I get all that. The When I was a kid in the Bronx, I didn't understand it. And when I, like I said, when I, when I would go to Harlem, I heard about the ghetto boys because kids would brag about older things. Yeah. And the word on the street about the ghetto boys was that they had a motherfucking bazooka. <laughs> like everybody else had a knife and yeah. they had a bazooka. They were showing up with a bazooka. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and the song was, do you want to get it higher with the ghetto brother power? Oh, shit. Power, power. Like, that was like that little theme shit about oh, gangs. Oh, fuck. But I didn't know nobody in no gangs. I didn't run no, nobody came up to me and asked me if I wanted to cut my hand and shake hands. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Nothing like that. I can't. Yeah. Nah, man, like, speaking of juvenile hall, like, a lot of my friends went to juvenile hall, and, and in California, there's juvenile hall, and then there's those crazy motherfuckers that go to CYA, California Youth Authority. I had a homie that was in there from like 13 or 14 to 25. They call it adult life. Like instead of sending you to prison, you go from 14 to 25. And like he was fucking, he got out and he was just like, dog, it ain't like prison over here. There, There is gang banging. Mexicans and Mexicans is like, look, you're from my opposite gang. We're going to go back. Or we're going to fight. It was like some crazy shit. Homeboy was telling me like motherfuckers would like get your ass beat like in there. If you drop something and picked it up, they put you on this thing called the leva, where like from now on people can just sock you and do whatever they want. <laughs> so if you drop something, it's just gone now. That's it, dog. Like if you're drinking coffee and that shit falls, you're like, "Hey, my boy," <laughs> like, "Yeah, dog." And those guys, they go to prison and they're out of fucking control. They call them YA babies. Like, oh, this motherfucker's a YA baby. Like, he don't fuck around. And uh. Yeah, man, that's uh, that's that's they hey, they shut two of them down, Joey. So many motherfuckers were getting like bad shit happening to them. They had one in Norwalk and one in Sacramento. And fuck, I can't, I can't imagine. Hey, dog, I, I heard imagine. people get raped in there. Oh, please, yeah. that's that's the main concern. because that's it's the main fucking thing. Oh. They're kids. What do you think they're doing? They're savages. They don't know. Yeah. They don't have the manpower at those places to control those people. Mm -hmm. And they're doing like six, seven years. You know, at that age, you don't, yeah. your head doesn't comprehend it. Like, your head doesn't comprehend it. Like, you can see the, let's talk about the Miami, the shooter in Florida. Like, I just saw a picture of him. There's a shooter in Florida? The guy that just went off at the school about okay. a year ago. Yeah. Oh. That kid, you know, he, he doesn't even know what is going on. Mm -mm. Like, he doesn't know what's going on. And now they're going to put him into a system that he's doesn't done. really know what they're, that they're going on. And he's he special treatment, so he's going to be in the psychiatric services the rest of his They're going to med him up, too. And they're going to med you up. You know, the, prisons, the prison system is not a good fucking... No. Is not a good fucking system. Especially now, you can't smoke in there. Can you imagine? No, you. It's it, it's cigarettes? all money now. We, we it costs three bucks a fucking cigarette for a pinner. If if you had like a real marble light, you can break that up into five cigarettes. It's all bad. It's all fucking bad. And you know what's even crazier about the prisons I just read about is now they 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 have a regular a prison has two yards. They got a protective custody yard, special need yards for. Gays, um, snitches, people that, uh, what's that shit called? Pedophiles. They separate them from the main, main line. Fools like me that like, hey, dog. Now there's so many of these fuckers on this side. They're the, the living is, they can't live there. What is it called? Bad living or something? Bad living condition. Yeah, bad living condition. So now they're putting all these motherfuckers on the main line. And telling the main line, like, hey, you're going to stab this fool. We're just going to give you life. So they're creating riots every fucking day. And I guess an inmate wrote a letter to, like, their family. And now there's families outside protesting saying, dude, my, 
My husband has six months left. He's been down for 15 years, and you're going to put a pedophile on his yard knowing that they have to stab this motherfucker? Like, that's some fucking crazy shit. Once they find out that, because I didn't go to any of the big prisons. I went through the system. First, you go to that place where they test you. And yeah. See if you're retarded. Reception. They ask you <laughs> questions. And that was fucking three weeks of hell. Uh, that was three weeks of just no sleep, people yelling all night. It was cold, and the bed was metal. Yeah. Then they transferred me to another place for about a, uh, two weeks. That was okay. It had pods. There was fist fights. There was shanking. Uh -huh. But I, I read books. That's it. I didn't know nobody. I made friends with a black dude, and that was it. Then I went to my destination. My destination was a prison camp. Yeah. There was a barrack for snitches. Yeah. But you weren't supposed to know. They were not witness relocated guys. They were that other thing that they put in there. Protection, whatever. Special needs. Special protection. Yeah. So you don't even know. We didn't PC, know. PC, protective custody. Right. You didn't know. And then somebody would get a letter from somebody going, hey, yeah. is this guy at your camp? This guy was the one that ratted out mm -hmm. the Gonzalez brothers in 1984. He's just getting out. Stab him. Like, it would go like that. And we yeah. would hear it. But the prison camp I was at was very calm. It was one of the best camps. They had enough inmates for the thing. The city of Golden really monitored it. It's where they make Coors beer. Oh, so wow. So Coors don't, didn't want it there. So Coors fought against making it grow and all this shit. They wouldn't hire the people from the plant. Where the other prison camp of that nature, Rifle, the city of Rifle, close to Aspen, about an hour from Aspen, they, the community, gave you jobs. So even though you were in prison in the summer, you worked at the pool as a lifeguard or selling popcorn or hot dogs. <laughs> or the hot dogs. In the winter, you worked at the ski resort. Okay. They would let you work at the ski resort. <laughs> wow. And there was people who worked at the movie theater. Wow. Like Throwing the, the trash out, all that right. shit. Right. We were allowed to leave for 20 minutes a day, you know. Damn, we I didn't get none of that shit. Yeah, I was a lot. This was before furloughs. Because yeah, somebody went crazy in Boston. Then when I got into prison, there were still furloughs. Oh fuck! You did like ten years, and you had five left. You were eligible for furloughs if you, but your behavior had to be impeccable. Impeccable, like impeccable, which was really hard. That to, it's too hard. It's impeccable. It's got to be impeccable. Like if there's a sock outside your locker and all that <laughs> type of shit, like that impeccable. <laughs> But when Fuck. I got to the camp, that you heard the one thing with me was that where I went, there was still the isolation groups. But because I knew about money and how money worked, I went through there with no drama at all. Of course, <laughs> the kitchen was filled with blacks and Mexicans, huh? so I had them from the kitchen. And then, then you have the white power group, and you had the bikers. That's weird that they separate like that over there. Yeah, at that time, it was the white power group and then bikers. And then there was this one white power dude that was a different white power dude. Oh, wow. He hated a certain type of people, <laughs> but he was really badass. So when I went to prison, he became my friend. He was from Philly. Okay. So I fucked with those white dudes. Uh huh. The biker white dude was in there from voluntary manslaughter, and he wasn't a good dude. Yeah, you could just tell. But fucking. he gambled with me, so he was cool. The white dude, the one who hated blacks and Latinos and Jews, he was a degenerate gambler. And he loved Mexican food. <laughs> he loved fucking uh, burritos. There was oh, yeah. one Mexican dude in him that would do business all the time. That's why that joke from Jerry Rocha has always made me laugh about him going home for Christmas and white people being at this house for Christmas in the back that hate Mexican people, but then they're like, man, but this house is good. <laughs> you know, look at them, they're fucking up the words, the jingle bells and all this shit, you know. <laughs> I love that joke when he says, look at them fucking up the words, the jingle bells. But this bean dip is sure tasty, you know. <laughs> that, 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 I mean, the guy that hated Mexicans loved Mexican food. So on Sundays, he cut a deal with the Mexican dude. The dude would give him green chili uh, burritos. Oh, and man. this dude would go bananas. So oh. I didn't really experience that like you see in the movies where 
we're at war, but not really. I can't talk to George because I'm with the Italians. Uh, dog, I lived that and shit. George can't talk to me because he's uh. with the Mexicans. And then we'd get thrown into a laundry. And after a week, you got to say something to me. I can't. Can you believe that shit? Like, yeah. You got to say something to me. Like, I can't. You, you would know already because if we did talk, like, look, Joey, if you're my enemy in there and we know each other from Yeah, but you, we're not enemies. Let's say I'm with the Italians or I'm with the Cubans. I mean, you're allowed to then. But, but if yeah, you're in, the Cubans have no dealings with essays, nothing. In fact, we're friends. We switch yeah. food. Oh, yeah, we can. But it's yeah. just where, where I was at, there was no contact with any black at all. There was it was it was just common, like, excuse me. Good morning. That's it. It wasn't more like, hey, dog, so where are you from? How? When's your birthday? What's your favorite color? Who do the Jews hang out with? Because we can't hang out with the Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, you guys get great lawyers, bro. <laughs> you don't really know. There's not, that, there's not too many Jews in there. That's funny. But there is, and you guys roll with the others. There's others? Yeah, others is. There's Mexican, white, black, and others. And Paisa. There's Paisa, too. And then there are others is like. You hang out with like the Asians, Samoans, Russians, Italians. Samoans, okay. Yeah, because now, now what's the between the Pisces and Mac in a jail? Here? A Paisa is someone that is not from America. They're Mexico, El Salvador, Honduran. When you're Mexican, you're just from here, or you claim it. You're from a gang. If you're not from a gang and you're Mexican, and you're just like, hey dog, I'm a Paisa, and you're like, all right, cool. You know what now, I mean? If you're a Mexican and you're not in the gang, and you've been robbing on your own for 20 years and slinging, <laughs> and you go to prison, you got to join one of their gangs. You got to choose, homie, or fucking. How many gangs do I have to choose from? The Mexican, that's it. Like Northern and Southern? I don't I don't speak on that, but. Okay, fair enough. What about like the Latin <laughs> Kings and all that? Hell no. Nah. They would be like, look, homie, you're over here. <clears throat> This is our rules. That's it. Were there Latin kings where you were at? Nah, that don't that doesn't that's exist. On the East Coast. Yeah, that's East Coast. Okay. That's that's a whole nother flavor because Latin Kings, they got white, black, met they have every race in there. Really? Hell yeah. <laughs> I thought the Latin Kings are just Spanish dudes. No, nah, the Puerto Ricans, Ricans Dominican, Dominicans. Dominicans and you know some Dominican fuck this black person thinking they were Dominican and it's so mixed up. How scared should I be? Outside my building, there's an MS-13 tag on, on like, the the wall. That's probably, like, the fucking guy that delivers sparkly. It was just like, hey, <laughs> I'm going to fuck a plaque on the wall right here. All right, here. fair enough. I know, but is it old, new? Like It looks, I, it's the first time I've seen it recently here. Where do you, I don't know, don't tell me where it's, you it, it's in, I live in, like, n- near Studio City. It's not yeah. in a bad area. Hey, mom, nah. Don't, don't, don't buy it. He doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, Some 13-year-old yeah. kids in this fucking block that fucking. You think so? I know so. Look at the fucking neighborhood. Yeah, it's Studio City, though. What are yeah. we doing over there? Yeah. What are, we doing? What are they doing? What are they doing? It's not doing? really studios. You know, there's a fucking pizza place over there. I go to Danielle's. Yeah. It's okay. Nice yeah. people, nice owners. They've gotten broken into three times. People are hungry six right months, now. Right. The other night I drove by there on Laurel Canyon. I was parked at the light. And I sat there at the light and I lowered the window because I used to be a burglar. Course. If you smash that window, the whole neighborhood hears it. He said that all three times. The camera didn't catch it. No, he caught it. He, oh. he he got he call he wakes up. He calls the cops. He's watching them on the camera on his phone as they're going in. Going for, he goes. I leave forty dollars in here at night. But the point of the story is that I was sitting there. There's a gas station that's open twenty four hours. There's a Jack in the Box that's open twenty four hours. There's a Subway sandwich on the corner that's in there hidden next to a Starbucks. Nobody heard. Like, he's like, it's the weirdest thing. I sat there in the car. I know as a burglar, if I would break that, the way it it would echo. It would just echo. There's a Sprint store there. I mean, it's tough to be a burglar now. Fuck, there's cameras everywhere. There's cameras everywhere in people's houses and you ever catch them on the news how they get confused <laughs> and they take their camera off to scratch their head and the, and the, and the camera gets them right there like what yeah, the no. fuck no, it's fucking hard in here it really. would be so fucking hard to do anything anymore like i think of the shit i used to do and i would have been busted trusted oh uh, i would i would like steal their cell phone and subscribe to george press stories on it all right i'm a subscriber i'm gonna do some shit I don't uh, know nothing about cell phones, but I would just be fucking robbing shit. I used to rob houses, but never, like, I I was, oh, fuck, Joey. I wanted shit, dog. So when I was, like, 18, 
I wouldn't rob a house, but like if a rich ass, no disrespect, but rich ass white girl invited me to her crib. Oh, it was going down. Come on, yeah. dog. The age, listen, from the age of 16 to 30, everything I did was a case. <laughs> everything, if you invited me to your house, you just put yourself on a list for me to rob you. I looked around. <laughs> like, if you invited me to your house, like I, that's what I would do. <laughs> I am a security expert. When I look at your house, I could tell you if you're going to get robbed and why you're going to get robbed and how you're going to get robbed. There's yeah. just different percentages. You know, if you leave your backpack in the front seat of your car oh, there, that's with your sign. computer, they're gonna they're gonna br break it. If you put it on the front floor, and the black the backpack is black, and they don't see it, they're not gonna break yep, it. Yeah, cover car. it with the sweater. It's or really fucking stupid what life is about. You know, in the one thing I never did was I hated car stereos. Like there was just so many things that I wouldn't do. There was a point for years that in America, if you robbed the car stereo, you couldn't do nothing with it. Because once you took it out, you couldn't play in another car. Mm -hmm. Unless it was aftermarket, like if you went and bought like a whatever. But if you took like a Chrysler stereo out, there's nothing you could do with it. Even if you put it in another Chrysler, it was fucking... There's so many crimes that people do for little shit and they cause so much havoc. Yeah. And it pisses me off. Like if you leave dollar bills in the certain middle of your thing, you know how you pay for tolls? Yeah. You put change in there. They're going to break the if window. If you put singles in there, they're going to break your window. They're going to break your window at four in the morning for, for three four fucking dollars. Yep. And now you got to pay 150 and now, Yeah, and now you just paid 150 This When I go into a place, I look at the security of the place. And I look at the people, and I ask if I go to the bathroom. I love the people that you go to the bathroom, and you have to walk through a bedroom, and they got a jewelry box right there. Yeah. You're going down. <laughs> you're going down I'm going to get the case of the shits and steal one of your wedding I mean it was just dumb like when people would have parties uh, I would rob parties all the time like if people would say oh yeah it's a party it's a friend of mine mm -hmm. he's having a party in Tenafly that's the first place that you went <laughs> and next thing you know you're on the second floor under the bed <laughs> fucking with the little girl's fucking pony bank and the, you know <laughs> Piggy bank and shit. It's fucking embarrassing, dog. It's embarrassing the shit. You've done do. some crazy shit. I've done some shit. I used to break into this house so much that they would leave me notes. <laughs> like, fuck you. Hey, wipe your feet, asshole. Like, I would rob them once every 90 days for like two years. Oh, shit. I robbed them once every 90 days, a drug dealer. Why didn't got, they put a lock on the door? They what did everything they could. I would just rob them just to let them know they were stupid. Yeah. Just to let them know they were stupid. They had a back window that I could open like nothing. Ugh. And if nothing pisses me off more than when I rob you and I come back and you still haven't fixed that problem. <laughs> I will rob you again just out of principle. I robbed that fucking apartment. It was a fucking gay dude who sold <laughs> drugs. And I knew he had to work. Like, I knew him to another gay guy, and I knew he had to work. <laughs> and I would rob him certain hours. Damn. The, like, the first three places I robbed of him, like, the first time he left money in, like, a jar in his, uh, like, like when on he, a dresser or yeah, something? Yeah, like, on a dresser. Oh, I man. just stuck my hand in there, and it was $450. In those Fuck, days. that's on money. On a Friday morning. Oh. And there was, like, an ounce of Coke somewhere. Oh, oh, my, oh, my God. And then I waited, like, 90 days. He never accused me. And I went back again, and this time he hid in his lover's room, and I robbed that one. <laughs> and then I went back like six months later, and I robbed him again for something else, for Coke again. And then after that, I waited, and I robbed him again, and I went to the first two spots, and both of them had notes like, fuck you, asshole. <laughs> oh, years shit. later, like. Why didn't you leave him a note back? Like, haha, I got I, your I gun. I don't have that type of time, Lee. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Let's say he's a stenographer. I'm fucked up. <laughs> he knows an FBI dude. I used to do some creepy shit, dog. There was this dude that just pissed me off. <laughs> I think I told this story. This is when I went to Colorado. You know those motherfuckers that every time you cook and you're about to eat, they ring your doorbell? And they're like, man, I was, his name was Ken. Uh -huh. And he was from Kentucky. Telemarketer? No, he was just a white dude that would, he lived upstairs. He oh, was, he wanted to talk and eat. He was right above me. But he always knew when we were cooking. He always knocked on the door and he always go, I hope I didn't interrupt nothing. Oh, my God. And, and me being fucking me, I go, You want to sit and get something to eat? He, sure. You know, he was one of those goofy dudes that rode a bike with the helmet on, even <laughs> in the 80s and shit. Ugh. So, you know, we'd smoke pot with him and shit. And, and he was like an artist type dude at the time. He was way older than me. If I was 18, he had to be like 25. But he lived right above me. I lived on the first floor, 
and he lived right above me on the second floor. And, you know, we, we became friends. We were like friends for like four months. He would come over at night and smoke with us. A lot of people did. Did he rob you guys? No, he pissed me off. Oh. Because his mother sent him money, and he came and bragged about it. And I go, you know, I just made like a comment. I said, what's the story? Why don't you go get a six-pack and yeah. come over and drink it with us? You know, you're here every night smoking our pot and eating our food. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, man. I, I got to hold on to this money. This, this got to last me. And that night, he went out to a bar in Aspen. Like on the way out, he came. I was watching TV, and I had money at the time, not millionaire money. Yeah, but like you that. had it. I was making like 10 bucks an hour. The rent was paid, and I had like 800 in the bank. And I remember watching TV, just being pissed off <laughs> that this motherfucker wouldn't even buy a six pack. Yeah. And then the door knocks, and it's him all dressed up. And he's like, I'm going to Aspen. Anybody want to come? I got to meet some girls up there and all this shit. I'm going to have a good time. I'm like, this guy doesn't know I'm going to rob this motherfucker <laughs> because I know he's cheap. He didn't take all the money with him. He didn't yeah. have time to deposit it because he had gotten it later in the day. So there's got to be cash upstairs. So I waited like an hour downstairs. My roommate was on a date. I was all by myself, lonely as shit. I had the money to get coke, but I was going to rob this motherfucker <laughs> at one point. And I went out there and I put a table out there. And I tried to jump, and I couldn't make it, so I put a chair on top of the table. And I went out there like a Houdini, and I still couldn't match, and I put like a chair on top of a chair on top of a chair on top of a table. And then I finally fucking got to his balcony, and, bro, the balcony was open. Ah. I just had to slide it open, and I went in the house, and I looked everywhere. I fucking looked everywhere for that money, and I could not find it. He had a bicycle with a little pouch in the back where you put, like, your fucking deflator yeah. and your spare tire. I went in there. Nothing. This motherfucker took it with him. I went back down, but I left the front door open because sometimes I leave the front door open just to think about it. And I come back and shit. <laughs> and about an hour later, I went to the bathroom. I hit the bathroom. And sure enough, I opened up a metal Band-Aid case, and there's this Gitas. Wow. A couple hundred dollar bills. I take the money, I close it, I close the mirror. I lock the balcony, but I leave the front door open. So when he comes home, he knows his front door is open. Yeah. Man, I think I locked it. So the next morning, sure enough, first thing. And he's like, hey, man, I got robbed last night. Really? What time? I just played it off. <laughs> and then he left and he came back and he's like, you know what, man? I've been thinking, you and your roommate, you're both two, two, New, York, two New York City hustlers. What a piece of shit. I heard, I heard that you had burglarized the place once or twice in your life before. I think you burglarized me. I said, Ken, I didn't burglarize you. <laughs> <laughs> he came back downstairs with a piece of scotch tape. He said, I got fingerprints. I'm going to take him down to Snowmass Police Department right now and get the fingerprint lifted from the scotch tape. And I'm like, oh, this poor bastard. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> And then he never talked to me again. He knew I robbed him. He would tell my roommate, I know it was him. I know he yeah. robbed me. Fuck yeah, I'm going to rob you. All you had to do is buy a six-pack of beer, and I wouldn't yeah, have robbed It's you. a lesson learned, dog. Yeah. Don't do shit like that. Fucking with me. Yeah. Motherfucker. We buy, buy you eating steaks. I used to go every night and shoplift two steaks. You wouldn't even buy the meat? No. I would buy salami. <laughs> uh, I would buy Oscar Mayer salami and, make, and a head of lettuce. Them? And I would take two T-bone steaks. And put them in my winter jacket. And I'd go home on the shuttle and I'd have my roommate cook the steaks because uh, I bought yeah. them. And I'd cut the salami and cut lettuce and put salami, tomatoes, and lettuce. And I'd make like a Genoa salad with vinegar and oil. And we'd just make fucking T bone steaks. And that fucking sounds that. bomb. Dog, I don't fuck around. Since the early age, I don't fuck around. Yeah, I feel But like I'd that. steal those nice T like those $10 T bones. <laughs> Back in the day, a $10 T bone, that was big time and shit. Yeah. <laughs> shit. I was a one-man fucking wrecking crew. Oh, yeah. And I loved it. I, lo I think about it sometimes, and I'm like, dog, I feel bad for the sins I did. But <laughs> no, I didn't, because most of the people I robbed were just plain out scumbags. Anyway. Yeah. I feel you. I, I got robbed when I was, like, 21 by my baby's mom, and I didn't, like, put it together until I was, like, 33. How'd you get robbed? I, I broke up with her, and back then... I used to, uh, my parents, like, they owned houses. So they were like, look, you guys can stay in this house. It's a four bedroom. I rent out one bedroom and then just pay the difference. I'm like, all right, cool. So my baby's mom back then was a big ass fucking tweaker. And she used to hang out 
She's been to juvenile hall. My baby's mom, the oldest one. The How old is she now? You she's forty. My no, she's from my son Georgie. <clears throat> my daughter's eleven. My other son's nineteen, and my Georgie's twenty-two. Georgie, his mom, she fucking. So I told her, hey, you got till today to take all your shit out. And I didn't come home because I was out fucking other bit bitches. And <laughs> I come home, and the whole house has ketchup and shaving cream all over the carpet like back then a fucking dvd player was at 150 they took all my shit and they even robbed the roommate that was there and she was hanging out with the girl that was dating some fool that had a that had a jewelry like a pawn shop jewelry and shit and they took all the jewelry and i just put it all together later because i seen that fool from the jewelry shop he was like yo dog did your lady ever give you all that money from the come up I was like, what come up? He was like, yeah, dog. She told me that you guys you guys robbed somebody and she brought, you didn't want to come in, so you brought the jewels in. She brought them in so it wouldn't look like you did it. And I was like, that bitch robbed me, dog. <laughs> she would have been my first my first suspect. Yeah. You just broke up with her. She like they put ketchup and stuff. I, I know, but it was more like I was kind of scared of her, dog. I just wanted her out of the fucking house. You know what I mean? Because like she had cousins that would come down and fucking stab me. I was just more like, hey, I'll take this $300 loss. Get the fuck out of here. I tell you what, there's nothing like getting robbed. <laughs> and because you're a thief, you just write it off with no drama. <laughs> exactly. Like, I remember the first time I got beat. I got beat big, dog. I was about 16. I was about 17. And I was working at Putnam Fuel pumping gas. Oh, where's that? Button Fuel? Putnam Fuel, this place. It was in, it was on the border of North Bergen, where I'm from, in Secaucus, New Jersey. Okay. Dingy. A gas truck, station, dog? Truck drivers. Dingy. Women sucking dick in the back. <laughs> you know, this was... Slapping them in the back with squeegees? Doing, this is when people were doing, were doing black beauties. Uh. And you would snort black beauties. Uh. So you would open up the capsule and s snort the black beauties and shit. And Sniffing paint and all that shit? I don't know what they did back there. I never got involved. I, I knew they were white... And they were scary, and they looked like people from Walking Dead, and the Walking Dead wasn't <laughs> even out yet. So I left them alone. But I got a job working there. And, you know, it was a couple nights a week. The Gamios got me the job. Julio Gamio and his brother Caesar were both big timers there. They had worked there all their life as kids, like since they were eight. And now they would hire people for Putnam. It was open 24 hours. <clears throat> and, bro, so one night these brothers came in. Cool as shit, black dudes. Mm -hmm. Look like all four super flies. They got out of the mm -hmm. car, paid for the gas, tipped me. And yeah. they were like, can you get rid of some reefer? You like smoking reefer? I'm like, fuck yeah. They go come back, look at the trunk of the car. And they I opened up the trunk of the car, and it was like fucking 10 pounds of marijuana. Fuck. Right there, bro. And they said, take a bud. Bro, I took a bud, and I cut that bud, and I rolled it up. And I saw the fucking devil. <laughs> I saw the devil. And I had a friend that had big money. He sold coke. This is 1980. Oh. I'm in high school. My mother had just died. And this dude was a fucking pedophile. This dude was like just Harvey Weinstein and a pedophile put together. He's on <laughs> Facebook now. I ain't going to call him out and shit. But like as a kid, I would go to his house, and he always had a robot. There was a couple people in those days that always had a robot. There was a pedophile on my block called Puerto Rican Nelson. <laughs> he always had a robot. <laughs> this motherfucker would help you play football with a robot. I'm sure he <laughs> wants you to suck his dick with no underwear on <laughs> with a robot playing football and shit, helping you change your tire <laughs> with a robot in the fucking wintertime and shit. And this uh, dude, <laughs> this dude, I had a friend that couldn't wasn't allowed to go to dude's house for a certain reason. Oh. So he would give me money, and I would go to dude's house, and it made me look like a big shot. Dude and him were cousins, but dude was a cop. Oh, so shit. So dude couldn't be seen with dude. Yeah. <clears throat> so dude would go go over there and buy a gram, two grams, three grams, and it would help my cred. I'd go over there and say, look, I'm selling for you. Throw me a little something. Yeah. Straight up I, like a G. And I'm 17. I don't know how many times I went over there. This guy would always have a fucking robe on and shit. What time of the day were you going over there? Always. Right after school. I would get out of school. Was it right just away. underwear under? Like he would have like bikini underwear. <laughs> like 
And every time I went out, every time I went in there, he'd be coked out from the night before. This is before anybody was getting coked up. Like well, the only people I saw getting coked up from the night before at that time was my mother and her friends. This is the so this is outside of the house now. This was my mother was dead, and this was the first guy that would get high, and I would call him like at two and say I'm coming over, and he was still high from the night before, like the dude in Boogie Nights. I know exactly. Who you're that was about. like that dude with his hair still combed with the, good. With the Chinese guy that was yeah. like firecrackers. Yeah, he always had like a guy over there or some creepy girl. Yeah, there was always something going on when you went to his house. But I would go over there all the time and buy coke from him and front coke from him, and he always took care of me. So I took, <laughs> I took him the weed, and I go, listen, man, I bumped into these fucking yams from fucking Camden. <laughs> they got a hotel room. Up in room four four eight up here, and they gave me their number. They got the bag. I go smoke it. Tell me what you think. The guy called me the next day. He's like, "Dog, that's the best weed I've ever smoked in my life." I think they wanted eight hundred a pound, bro. I don't know. I think they wanted six hundred a pound. I tacked on two. Exactly, and dog. They wanted three pounds. Patty Boy, that was his name. Uh-huh. So I'll take three pounds. So I went over there at a certain time. I picked up the three pounds. I picked up the cash. And I met the, the black dudes at the fucking uh, Putnam Field. Until this day, I don't know how they did it. What happened? It was one of those, give us the cash, go to the trunk, and pull the weed out. And when I went to the trunk, I pulled the weed out. And they said, don't, we got cops watching us. So don't look at it till you get to your car. Uh, and when I got in the back seat, I opened it. And it was... Three Less. pounds. So let's say <laughs> three pounds is uh, 32 and 16 is 42, 48 ounces. There's maybe four ounces of real weed on top. Yeah. And the rest was just a brick condensed. And I didn't know. I took it to him like a fucking drug. I took it to him like Tony <laughs> took it to. Remember <laughs> when Tony, no, no, no. Remember when Tony Montana. Took the guy the kilo of coke. And yeah. My friend Angel Fernandez died. <laughs> but this is my gift to you. Yeah. I went over there like thinking I was Johnny Vespucci. Like, here's what I did. The guy took the top bag out and the rest were bricks. And he looked me in the face. He goes, listen, I don't know if you know how men do this. We got beat. And in reality, I didn't get beat. You got beat. So I gave you 1800 cash. I need my money back, whatever. He's like, I think I gave you 2400 cash. I need my money back. I need it back in two days. And that's the first time I ever got put. Like, that was like. Yeah, it's mission time. And I couldn't get him beat up. I couldn't beat him no. up. In my world, that's what it is. If I call Lee and I go, Lee, George Perez is giving you a gig down in Oklahoma. And you go down and George don't pay you. You got to look at me. Next time, shut your fucking mouth. Yeah. Well, now yeah. you learn to shut your fucking mouth. You don't know nothing about nothing. I don't know nothing. Because George beat him. And then and it happens. It's gonna happen. It happens in comedy. Straight up. It happens when you got a you go somewhere and you get a basketball for a check. Uh huh. You don't know till you come back. I did. I did Pachanga. Supposed to get twenty four hundred. The guy I was that was supposed to pay me, dog. This motherfucker brought his luggage in my room, hung up his clothes in the closet and shit. We got drunk, did coke. I fucking passed out. I woke up. Everything was gone but his clothes. Never paid me <clears throat> nothing. Finally, I fucking found that fool. I don't want. I don't want to say his name, but you know who he is. He's a punk motherfucker. I just went at him like a straight man. I said, "Look, dog, I need two hundred bucks every two months. I don't care what your problems are. I lost out big. I was supposed to make like twenty five hundred, dog. Left with like minus five hundred because you know you gamble at Pachanga. You eat, you stay, and oh, that motherfucker got me good. No, but that was the first time I got beat. And they did it beautifully. And I got beat in the that city. That is smooth. I got beat in the city when you buy ass in New York on 42nd Street in the old days. They would tell you the same line. Okay. Don't look at it till you get down the corner. And then you open it up and it's a coffee filter. <laughs> it's a fucking piece of paper with coffee stain on it. Oh, wow. And they would sell you blood acid. You know, th- those feelings are horrible. Fuck I'm going to tell you yeah. the worst beating I ever took, dog. I was selling cars, George. Uh, George, that's your name. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm selling cars. I'm the type of motherfucker when I'm wheeling and dealing, it's a cost of doing business. But when my sweat's involved, straight up, it's it's a different story. When I'm wheeling and dealing, I'll give you whatever you want. But when I'm sweating, 
Stepping on toes now. You're stepping on toes. So, what the fuck was I going to tell you about? Wheeling? Talk about how you were dealing cars. I was selling cars. And I had put away money. You had put away money. Oh, yeah. Like, like I'm talking, I was. Not even in the bank, huh? I never put away money. At this time, I had gotten out of prison. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start taking care of myself a little better. And I got a job washing cars at Hertz. And they put me in the employee residential manager program, so they gave me an extra $2. I was making okay money. My rent was four fifty a month. That was two and a quarter, you know. And I put away this money. I don't want to tell the amount. It doesn't matter. I put it away for two months after I got out of prison. You know, like when you get out of jail? I was out on bail, as a matter of fact. I'm out on bail. And I'm just about putting the pieces together. And I get a fucking VCR and a brand new Sony, whatever the fuck it was. Brand new, bro. I had never paid for nothing. I had always got, I would put TVs on stolen credit cards or <laughs> buy them stolen or I would steal the TV yeah. myself. This is the first time I sweat. And you know, one day I came home, my shit was gone, dog. Uh, I called my roommate, George, was his name at the time. I said, George, did you leave the door? No. They robbed my shit. I'll never feel like I, I'm a thief. I was a thief, but I've also been robbed. So I know what the perspective is. Like yeah, I know Peter pays Paul. Peter pays Paul. Like you, you just it's a, it's just it's <laughs> right? like it's like when you get a, like when I got arrested for the kidnapping, I accepted it. <laughs> like I accepted it. I accepted it for all my other sins. Mm -hmm. I didn't kidnap nobody. You tell what are you talking about kidnapping? I didn't send nobody a ransom note. No, kidnapping is when you do this and this and this. And it's, and it's like last week I made a joke, but I, I'll, I'll say this again with a different context. You see when Ronda Rousey got kicked in the head? Yeah. When she was laying there, sitting there, do you think she was thinking about the $8 million she was going to get? No. She was thinking about all the mistakes she made to gotcha. get to that place. When they're putting the handcuffs on you, oh. that's what you're thinking about. Hell when when yeah. that bailiff says, when that judge says bailiff, Put the cuffs in and take them into the back. When they put those handcuffs on you for a minute, you think about all the things you did. You think about throwing a rock at that priest when you were six. <laughs> you think about robbing that old lady's pennies. You think about the bicycle tube you stole. Oh, fuck. It yeah. all comes back to you. And, you know, they say when, when you. Spitting in your grandma's water. <laughs> yeah, they say that when you die, <laughs> your life flashes before you. It happens in a lot of situations in your life. You know, like when you're bombing at the comedy store, Mitzi's in the back. And you're eating a bag of dicks, and you're seeing your life in front of you, and you're also planning your suicide while you're on stage. <laughs> you can't even focus on material because you don't know whether you're going to jump off the Santa Monica Bridge <laughs> or you're going to jump off some pole with a fuck and whatever. You don't know. I mean, that's that that's the truth. You don't know what it's like to bomb in front of Mitzi on a no Thursday way. night. Oh, and it's quiet. Yeah, quiet. Fucking, you can hear. Toenails. I never got. I never got to perform in front. Yeah, of you her. can. You can hear toenails growing. Now, That's is this cool. in the OR room? This or? is in the original room. Okay. She saw me eat a bag of dicks in the main room one time, but there was one particular time in the original room. Like, it's in there where I remember What did being, she say to you? Nothing? Does she tell you shit when you eat dicks, or is it like... She would make an offhand compliment or say something to you to that would fuck with you, but at the same time, you would take it. She would never goof on you. No, no, okay. No issue. That was not yeah. her world. She would just say it wasn't your night. Oh, I don't like that joke. Like she saw, she told Rogan one time he couldn't do the end of the cold joke because people couldn't follow it. That's a compliment from her. Damn. She's like, you can't be doing that joke around here, dog. These motherfuckers fall apart. At the <laughs> Rogan was howling. <laughs> she told Rogan right out, you can't do that room, that joke in the main room, dog. About the Cole and that old dude she married. He wanted a Kentucky Fried Hooker and all that shit. You can't, because that bit, that bit used to just level room. Yeah. Before he died, he was 90, and his dying wish was to get a, a Kentucky Fried Hooker. So he married out in the call. His family was pleading with him, don't do it. She wants your money. I don't give a fuck. I'm 91. I'm going to suck them titties until I die. <laughs> Oh, it was a great bit. I forget it word for word, but I watched ah, him do shit. it. And bro, when he would do it, the comic in front of him, the guy, comic that had to follow him, 
you would just see their shoulders go down. <laughs> would go down because they knew it was going to be a long night. This is when he was still yelling. Okay. He was younger. He was yelling. He was Kennison in it a little bit. Okay. He ripped. He was ripping rooms apart, bro. I For 15 saw minutes, it. he was ripping rooms apart. Oh, yeah. But that Anna Nicole bit, that, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that you know, that, and that's how the joke ended. The joke ended with him dying, like, please don't die. And he's like, I'm not dead. <laughs> lick my balls. Lick <laughs> my asshole and all this shit. And that would just blow up the fucking room. But she would tell you little things. Like, okay. And she was right. Uh -huh. you, you did this. She's seen it all. You sped it up. You sped up your set tonight. You'd walk past her like in disgust. Like you'd walk past her like, no, and I'm not gonna get, ever get a fucking another spot here again. Like when you got off that stage, you were like, that's it. That was my run at the comedy store. And all of a sudden, you call her next week and you got five spots. Oh wow! Because she understood. Bro, the other night I went in the main room on Saturday night and I ate a bag of dicks, bro. Oh, yeah? Brian Monarch show. They just weren't buying me. Okay. But in the fifth minute, I I didn't do what I used to do. An, an, an inexperienced comic folds in the main room at the five-minute mark. And it's a long time till that light comes on. <laughs> and you're up there talking and now you're starting to turn red. Now you're starting to do stolen jokes. <laughs> you think about Cosby, fuck it, he's in jail. That material's, <laughs> that material's free as shit now. Oh, shit. You just want that fucking light to end. You know? <laughs> it, it, I just kept plowing through it. I knew they didn't like me. I knew they didn't like the joke I opened up with. I opened up with a joke that was a little too strong at the 7 o'clock show. And now you got to pay for your sins. I've been there yeah. before, but I can't give up. I no. got to go back, stand on my two feet. And plow through it like they're gonna get it. Like I'm going for a fucking. <clears throat> when I got out, of there, I could just tell. When I was walking out, they were like, "Look at me, like ill." <laughs> like they were giving me the ill thing, and I went into that fucking original room, and I just laid a beat on them, bro. It was basically I went out, I touched gloves, Next. I threw a jab to feel where the my distance was, uh -huh. and I just started taking body shots like Rocky in the eighth round. I was just hitting body shots, dog, bam. Even Kate Quigley called me. She was like, what the fuck? Uh, I just did 45 minutes and 15. That's what I do best. Uh, you do 40, 15 minutes of punchlines, a 10 seconds, a 10 second setup and just punchlines of 15 minutes. That's when you're just having fun. You just dissect your act. Okay, I got you. just take out the chitter chatter and just lay it on them. You got 45 minutes, you got 15. So you're just laying it on them. And what you're giving them is just body shots. At the end of the set, they just scattered like a massacre. <laughs> They're like all over the place trying to hold on to themselves. I love all that shit. I love all that shit. Fuck yeah. I'm ex hey, bro, I'm excited to be working with you, man. All the knowledge I'm going to get. And you know what it. knowledge? I get knowledge from you and shit. Yeah, nah, nah. It's just like the you always teach me like how to act and shit. I remember one time you'd be like, hey, you can't be going into the improv with your nose looking like that. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, I remember like you'd always tell me, hey, dog, don't party till you're done. You know what I mean? Because I used to fucking party hard, dog. Or I'd be drunk and shit. I don't know if you remember, but you'd always tell me that shit. I did. There was a certain etiquette. Listen, when you go to a club now, when you mm -hmm. start headlining, you're going to figure something out. You're going to walk into a club, and they can't wait to tell you gossip. Okay. They can't wait to tell you about who got 10 hookers last week. Yeah. They can't wait to tell you about Pablo staying till Wednesday. <laughs> You know, and, <laughs> and they can't wait to tell you about this guy, you know, doing shit to the wait staff or this yeah. chick firing weight people. They can't wait because I'm normal when I go to those clubs. I'm very thankful to be there. <clears throat> you know, there's people that lose LA and they lose their mind. They leave mm -hmm. LA and they lose their mind. They're fucking, what do you mean by that? They go to they go to Nashville and in their minds they're fucking real stars. I got you. I got you. You know, I never bought into that shit. I yeah. always stay very humble. I don't give a fuck about credits. So I've seen people with a thousand credits suck the biggest dicks on stage. Give me the guy with no credits. That motherfucker will kill you. You go to a local town as a feature act, he'll kill you. Yeah. Doing all feature shit, doing shit about the city, and he knows what's going on with her. They'll kill you. Those local features sometimes, they'll bury you. <laughs> they know about everything. They know the political or the city, the views of the city. And they're good. They're headlines. Yeah. They just have, they're just featuring for you. They got no credits. You better fucking watch yourself, dog. They'll fucking bury you, those guys. 
those guys that know about the area and the landmarks and they grew up there and shit, they're, they're fucking local comics. You know, when I lived in Seattle, you know, it's funny. When I lived in Seattle, when I left Seattle, I had 30 minutes. When I got to L.A., I had 18. Why? Because 12 was minutes was about Seattle. Oh, okay. When you live in a place and you become a local at that place. That's your bit. You know, what, are you, what am I going to do here? Talk about traffic? Done. <laughs> talk about the pollution? Done. Yeah. What are you going to talk about? Oh, there's too many Mexicans? Done. <laughs> there's too many Armenians? Done. They've all been done, you know. Open up that door for me a little bit. You know, so that's the problem you have. But once you, when you're developing in Boston, like if if you go to Boston, I've never been in Boston, and you go to an open mic on Monday in Boston, they're talking about local shit, and you're dying. You're fucking dying. It just yeah. I mean, you I'm know? I'm down for all that shit. I I can't wait to I get out to Boston. All that shit. I'm gonna I want to die with them and come back. Right. That's what but I want. Right do. now, you're at that precipice. You're at that precipice where you're featuring, you're headlining. You were emceeing. You got the credits. You've been on Showtime. I mean, you're right there. You're knocking on Evan's door. You're getting developmental spots at the store. I don't know if you've looked around lately. There ain't too many Mexicans at the store. No. No. Jesus Trejo. Yeah, that's it. You know, in the old days, there was 18 Mexicans at the fucking comedy store. No way. Yeah, man. Yeah? Yeah. Damn. Freddy. Johnny. <coughs> Luke. Luke. Where is Luke? Uh, I don't know. I see he posted something kind of funny I, he said that he had a bad dream and that he, he said he had a bad dream and he was watching a movie with a gay rambo and he, he called him ram bro and he's like they he's like they suck cock first now i mean you know how they drew blood first <laughs> you know luke dog I, he's, he's in a band he's a comedian right because he was a, he always loved music yeah he's good he was a music guy he was always a music guy yeah. but I, I think he's i think he does two or three years a gig a year as a cop. Yeah, I'm fuck. I don't know. I'm out here grinding, trying to get mine, hustling, working on shit. All together, how long have you been doing comedy now? <clears throat> 16, 17 years, but you got to take three off because I did three years in prison. So. Which is time. Man. Yeah, you did time served, and then yeah. you got to be funny. Yeah. So and then once you told people you're a comedian, well, tell me something funny, bro. Oh fuck. That's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> That's the. I worst. was hiding being a comedian. I didn't want no one to know. The fucking guards are the ones that fucking burned me. All the other ones. Yeah, because the guards at the prison I was at, the last one I was at was in Norco in Riverside. So these fucking guards, they've been to Wild well, Coyote, a Patio, Ontario Improv. They've been to the Ice House. These fuckers knew me like nothing, but they were like, "Homie, I used to watch you at Casa <coughs> Latina." It was fucking crazy. That's crazy shit. Like when a cop would be like, what's up, George? I'm like, bitch, you can't say fucking hi to me. You're making me look like a snitch or something. Yeah. So they never made you go on stage, right? I went on stage in prison in a prison. lot. And all Did the you? dorms. They had dorms. And a lot of the guards, are, they're mostly Mexican or like black. But like, yeah, they were, they, they're in there 12 hours, 15 hours themselves. They were like, fuck yeah, go up there, do comedy. So they would set it up and I would do comedy in each dorm. Yeah, it was dope, dog. I, I I had an opener. I found some Puerto Rico for that was my opener. His name was Rico. He was from Norwalk. But that fucking piece of shit ended up rolling it up. Rolling it up means when you tell to go to the protective custody yard because you know they're going to get you. Yeah, you know drugs fucking get everybody. That fool got fucked. <coughs> so you were doing stand-up, and how many minutes would you do? I'd do 25, 30, dog. How many nights a week? Once a month because, like... They had to make passes for me because when you're in prison, there's movement. So I, I had to go through two stations to get to where I was going. Like the guards would call it in. Yo, I'm sending Perez with two people. They got a radio. I would bring a radio. Like I would play music before the show and shit. <laughs> and then I would get my opener to go up and do four minutes. Best intro I ever fucking had, Joey. This fool goes, you might have seen him on Comedy Central. Now you could see him on the yard. <laughs> <laughs> he's like give it up for George Perez and they're like it was a hey, dog it was fun as fuck and uh, it made me realize that a lot of criminals are naturally funny because like 
Usually when you get off stage and you do a show, no one's going to try to give you a tag or like a little something for your joke. The fucking gangster trollers in there were giving me fucking funny ass tags. Hey, Holmes, you should say this, eh? And I was like, oh, shit, I'm going to use that. Yeah, it, it, it was it was cool. It was fun. Hey, dog, it was fun, but I, I just remember like, fuck, Joey, it'd be a Friday night, 730 and I probably think the reason I started doing cocaine again is I got this anxiety of like, I'm locked up. I can't go out and like be a man, tell jokes, go fuck, go to the liquor store, go fucking to the movies. You know what I mean? I'm in there and my window, there's a park across the street where there's families having fun, people playing. And that anxiety was fucking killing me. I remember I called Felipe Esparza one time and I was like, what are you doing? He's like, enjoying freedom. What's up? Hey, like. <laughs> it was fucking crazy, dog. Crazy. This last time you were in, how long were you in for? Three years. Three fucking years. Yeah, three years. Right after we filmed Paiso Comedy Slam. So we filmed Paiso Comedy Slam when? 2006. 2006. I went in June. I went in on Felipe's birthday. I think it's, uh, when's his birthday? June 11th? Yeah, June 11th. And yeah, that next was it. week I'm gonna talk about 2006. If I tell you where my head was at when I shot that special, I remember you were furious that you were there early. No, you would not. No, I wasn't furious that I was there early. You were a little overweight too. I remember. I was a lot overweight, <laughs> and I was just furious about life. Yeah, I remember. I wish that you know. That's why I, I told you in the beginning of this that. Being Kavanaugh is not fair. You can't come at somebody, except if they raped you yeah. or they physically put a pipe to your head or something like that, because your character has changed. When I did the Payaso Comedy Slam, this is how fucked up life is, that you work your whole life for a goal, and somebody comes up to you with a major opportunity that you frown upon, like I frowned upon Scott, and I old, and I called him like a man. When it aired, I called him like a man, because <clears throat> that's how I was raised. Yep. I frowned upon that opportunity. You know how much I prepared for my actual comedy slam? Zero. Damn. Zero. I didn't care about comedy. At that time in 2006. It was dark, huh? It was a really dark time. I had done the longest yard. And nothing had happened. Yeah. And a lot of people had told me that stuff was going to happen. So when nothing happened, it took me down. We shot that either the night before Thanksgiving. Yeah, it was the night before Thanksgiving. It was the night before Thanksgiving. They gave us. They gave me two thousand dollars. It pissed me off because they gave me a check. You know, like I was one of those guys. Like I got pissed off because the guy gave me a check. God forbid I couldn't buy cocaine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, God forbid I got to stop at Whitley at the check cashing place, cash this, and then go lose to buy like cocaine. Eight, yeah, lose 80 bucks. On but I think fuck. about the mindset in 11 years. That, when I shot that, I was a month or two away from not knowing where I was going to go. Like, at that point, I was thinking about breaking up with my wife. Damn. I was thinking about... Going back to the crime life? Nothing had happened. That's it. I had done a few movies. I had done a few TV shows. And you know what? These people don't want me. They're never going to get me. Is that the feeling you get in your head? Yes. yes. You're with Adam Sandler, Terry Crews. Yeah, that was great. That opportunity was fantastic. But everybody else, when when I first got here would do half those movies and their skyrocket success yeah. would be phenomenal. You know, fucking uh, Tracy Morgan got the show with the chick. Fucking Terry Crews got a bunch of shit. Mm-hmm. Everybody got shit except me and Lobo. Who's that? Lobo was the guy who played the linebacker that smoked cigarettes. He got Sons of Anarchy. Oh, yeah. He got two or three up and they cut his head off. That ain't no happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> and fucking, uh, you know, when you and I was already a comic for 15 years. Mm. I was already doing comedy 14 years. 
I had done Spider Man Two, Taxi. I did a De Niro movie. My now, name is Earl. No, 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 no. Now I just did a fucking Adam Sandler movie, and I still can't get an agent. I still can't get signed. I still can't get a. The I couldn't get a fucking theatrical agent. Like I had like a C fucking agent. I went to Innovative. I went to all these agencies that were like the B ones. All of them turned me down. This is with a fucking reel that started with De Niro killing me at a bar with, you know, with, with fucking uh, Anthony Lampaglia. I had some a great Fuck. fucking reel. Mad TV. I had a phenomenal reel. It's 2006. The longest yard was out a year. And it's killing. And nothing happened. I got a call for this. I got a call for that. And I shot something else. But what people blew the smoke up my ass, nothing happened. Nick Turturro did a movie with Tracy Morgan from that. Everybody did something from that except me. You know how bad I was feeling? I was pretty. I was feeling Fuck. pretty shitty. So I had already done comedy 14 years. I did everything you. I did Mad TV, which is a comedy yeah. thing, and I did this movie with Adam Sandler. And I'm still not going to Montreal. I'm, they're still not asking me about an HBO special. I'm still not. I, they don't have a picture of me at any improv. Yeah, you know, it's time. Like, what am I doing? Like I did every hurdle they put in front of me, but now they don't want to. Agree. That I was in a fucking bad place, bro. I would buy a package of coke at eight. I would go to the store. I would get on stage and snort it, and then I couldn't lie. I didn't want the drug dealers to know how much coke I was doing, so I had to wait till two to a bartender got off. His name was Johnny. What's the guy? make him buy it for you? No, I would make. <laughs> I would I, I would have him deliver after two. Okay. <laughs> I had a black guy, I had a Mexican guy at El Compadre, and I had a Mexican guy that sold coke on the street on uh. Western Boulevard and Sunset. If you just pull up at the car at the yeah. light, he'll come up to you and give you a blast. A Mexican guy, he lived like wow. in a tree. Dog, it was the craziest thing. When I couldn't, f <laughs> when I couldn't find coke anywhere else, all I had to do was turn go, the car go around, the tree. go to Western, pull into the McDonald's. <clears throat> make a u-turn and just park your car there for a minute and once i went back on sunset i would go on sunday with the light turned red and all of a sudden you see him come down from the tree <laughs> he come over to me dog i met him like a year early in that neighborhood one night like that monkey in hangover like, dog, i met him like coming back from a gig with coke in my pocket like i had money in my pocket and in those days i would get lost and call edwin because you know how they close the roads? Now yeah, like 11 oh, yeah, Edwin knew that shit. Edwin grew up here, so I yeah. would call Edwin and go, Edwin, they just closed the one, the 105. What do I do? And one night, I had to come home off the two. So I went through, I came off in Silver Lake, like by uh, Flies Colorado Road Yeah, road where there. Felipe used to live. And as I went on Sunset, I lived on Schrader. Dude, that's how I met this guy. At a light, we made eye contact. Like, he was standing there, like, with shirt on, flip-flops. Like, it was summertime. He was out there sweating. It was, like, 1 in the morning, and I was headed to cop. And he was just, like, on the thing, looking at me from the bus like stop. Like, what you want to do? And I asked him what's going on, and I pulled over. I just pulled over. He came over to the driver's side, and in Spanish, he asked me what I was looking for. I told him, Perico. That's and he right. asked me if I, he didn't even ask me if I was a cop. He went in his hand, and he crushed something up, and he put it in my nose. <laughs> So I couldn't even have a chance to yeah. tell him if I was a cop or not. I give him the amount of money, and he just put the coke rock in my hand, and I drive home <laughs> like the Domino's pizza guy, <laughs> with a little coke rock in my hand before it would melt and shit. <laughs> so I had a couple different connects. I was the dark place, George. Thinking uh, back now, oh my god, I I'm hated, just tripping out on it myself. I Fuck. hated being here. I was getting ready to leave the store. Like I like I left the store in two thousand seven, around there, mm -hmm. and I had already my mind was already made up. I had to get out of there. I had the surgery on my neck, for the fat ball they took out. Yeah. So I thought that there was bad spirits at the store. <laughs> I was fucked up, guys. I was fucked up, bro. I was fucked up. And then Scott called you on this. Like who who hit you up to do payaso? Scott called me and said, do you want to do payaso? And at that time, I thought Scott was a fucking payaso. I yeah. thought Scott was a fucking joke. Plus, Marilyn was on it, too. So you Marilyn had... was on it. Marilyn got me on there. God okay. bless her soul. Yeah, R.I.P. Marilyn Martinez was who fought for me to get me on there. 
And if you look at the tape, like those jeans, look at them. They're $10 jeans. I had combat boots on. <laughs> the black sweater. I had a shirt with a stain on it. I mean, I was just a fucking mess. You know, I was really, really, really a physical and mental mess. Like, I... What got you out of it, dog? <clears throat> I don't know. It it was like a slope. Yeah, you, you and Rent... I don't know, dog. I've reinvented myself, but it's still me what I feel. Like, I I don't know, dog. You've always... I remember you podcasted first for all of us from what I know, and I it's just you're going, dog. You're, people know you. It's going. No, no, no. Rogan did it, and then I did yeah. it with Felicia. And then, no, no, but it wasn't like that. I'm just thinking about how you really, really, really get yourself sometimes. I, dog, I was in a really dark place. And I wasn't suicidal. I, it wasn't like I was going to kill myself. I just, I had to make a move. Mm -hmm. 2006, how old was I? I was 43 years old. Damn. In 2006. I wasn't no young kid no more. Nothing was really happening for me, bro. Yeah, I, was, be, I was getting spots at the store. I was 29. That's it. I was just getting spots at the store. Nothing was really happening for me. I got these movies. I wasn't very much well liked. You know, I remember Montreal telling me that they didn't like the movement in my hand. But I created my own problem. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Let's not let's not uh blame society. In my head, in my coked out mind, I would create this fucking wall. There's a <laughs> there's a tape that if you really want to see how bad I was, you ask Red Band. You call Red Band tonight. And you go, Red Band, email me the link to the Joe show when Joe was talking. That had to be around that time. <clears throat> that was around yeah. that, that had to be around January of 2007 when we did the Joe show. And I was going to Vegas. Bro, I would get to Vegas with Joe on Thursday, get off the plane. We would do a show on Friday and do the UFC on Saturday. Doug, Joe and those guys would go eat Thursday. We go eat, and after that, I wouldn't see him till Sunday on the plane. Wow! I had a guy in Vegas, who, and at the time, the UFCs were were big. This is 2006. I had a guy in Vegas that you know how you have to get a key to go upstairs. He would just knock on your door. You call him. No he, way. He knew all, all the hotel security. He paid a vape to all the securities, so he would bring me fucking coke and Vicodins. That's a crazy mixture right there. And, bro, I would start eating the Vicodins, like, two or three or four or five of them. I don't know what I was eating. <laughs> and they don't make you no better either. They take you into a dark fucking cave. Fuck yeah. I smoked them on a blunt once. Oh, Jesus killed. Christ. Yeah. Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. But I would get, dog, I was in a dark, I don't know. I think I got, when I got the two cats, when I got Demi and Harry, Demi started making me laugh. Yeah, I had this kitten. I would go home at night and play with this kitten. And then by, by June of 2007, I knew something had to happen. So I signed up in that little rehab on Sunset Strip under a fake name. Oh, and shit. I went to a couple meetings and I tried it out, but I couldn't pull it off, bro. Somebody said to me, weren't you in the longest yard? And I just <laughs> said no and I You're got like, out of there. You were like Mickey Rourke and the wrestler yeah. when he's cutting me. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, your he, battle ran. That fool starts cutting him. Fucking yeah, he cut his arm and shit and ran out of there. Punching the chips. It was just a horrible fucking where my head was at. Uh, and then I started doing heroin. Fuck. That's, that's. And that was just. Yeah. You, dog, I'm telling you, you have no idea how lucky we are to be having a conversation here. Like I know. That. Because, like, I remember shooting payoffs. So I did not want to be there at all. It was, like, it was an inconvenience to finally do something that I wanted to do. That's how twisted and demented I know what you was. mean. You're like, you've been wanting to do this shit, and you're in this moment. All your life. Yeah. And now I give it to you, and now you don't want to do it. Now you're fucking bitching. I didn't stay in the hotel. I gave it to Dave. Yeah. They gave us, like, champagne and something else. I gave it away. All I wanted was the money, and I wanted to get the fuck out of there. Yeah. That was it. I didn't care about the art. I didn't care about anything. If you look at the set, it's a fucking horror show. Yeah. And all I was looking for was the light. Because that light meant the big Coke rock. 
Yeah. When that light came up, I wasn't doing like people who run the light. You're not going to see me running the light. <laughs> I, I never forget getting that check. And like, they're like, we're having an after party. Me going, I'll meet you at the yeah. after party. And dog, I got in that fucking car. And I remember them calling me like, where are you? And I, and I saw that sign like 19 miles from L.A. <laughs> and I was like, I'm already. And Dave said to me, dog, you didn't give me the key for your hotel room. Because uh, Dave wanted the extra hotel room for him and Marilyn because I yeah. had like a big room or some shit. When he called me and said that they got on Showtime, I can't tell you how bad I felt. Because you didn't give it your all on your full I phone, cannot huh? tell you how bad I felt. Damn. I thought you did good, dog. I knew that they had a... Bro, I was bombing. Those people were pure Mexicans that didn't have a sense of humor. I seen them laughing, dog. They but did. there was some like, yeah. Oh, because they like they like Alex Raimundo. They thought yeah. it was gonna be a night with Alex Raimundo with flicking your hair <laughs> and drinking tequila shots and shit. I'm no, out, I, I feel you on that. I'm out there like a fucking animal Savage. fucking and sucking and they were frozen. Did we do two shows or <laughs> we one? did two shows? Two dog. shows. We didn't sell it out. No. They were taking people off the street. <laughs> it was embarrassing. <laughs> From the first show, they asked yeah. him to stay on the second. Yeah, they asked him to stay for the second. It, it, it just, you know, it just, it just wasn't what I expected it to be. And then the smack in the face was the reality. The call from him going. It got picked up. He got picked up. And after they gave me the money, I didn't want to do the interviews. Like they kept begging me, <laughs> "Will you do the interview?" No, I don't want to. No part of it <laughs> because I had done so many of those at that point. That I was sick and tired of getting my fuck check. yeah. I had done so many Latino pilots at that time with so many different. I remember doing a Latino pilot in San Antonio with the back was a castle, the Latin, uh, you know, the Latin squires of comedy. <laughs> I did the, the Spanish kings of comedy. I did 20 of those pilots just for the paycheck. Yeah, it was keeping you a, a boat. They never went anywhere. What's the kid that books? The room close by here on third. Nice kid. Looks like De La Hoya for years. He would do the De La Hoya impersonation. I don't know. Sweet kid. You know, the money, you ain't going to get rich with him. Yeah. He used to book a room. I don't know. I'll never forget, like in 2005, after I shot The Longest Yard, he had 20 cameras at the Ha Ha. He paid me 800 flat. Again, part of the deal was, what time are we shooting? <laughs> 7.15. I want to be out of there by 7.30. Damn. You do? You'll do it? I go, yeah, 800 bucks. Do you know that that fool still calls me once every six months and says, hey, man, we just got good news. <laughs> Telemundo might pick it up on my dog. That was 10 years ago. Nobody wants to see Who that. the fuck is this person? I want to know I now. And he got a financer. He got like a drug dealer. Oh, shit. The guy, they, they built the set at the Ha Ha, and the drug dealer sat like on a throne with like three <laughs> fat, ugly Mexican bitches that had been beat up. A thousand times, their feet were busted. <laughs> you could tell that they were failed. They even failed at being hoes. Like they yeah, just, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I know what you mean. I Gilbert. am not fucking kidding you. The headliner was Gilbert. Oh shit! With the, with the yellow suit on and the preacher Bible, like it was on. Like I, bro, I had shot so many of those things. Fuck. I shot one with Carlos Oscar. I shot one when they came to me. And they said I couldn't be dirty. What's the one we shot for Jeff Valdez, the first one? Uh, the first one I shot with Jeff Valdez. Latino they, Comedy Festival. Latino Comedy. I shot everything. That was a weird one. I remember Willie hosted that one. Then we shot the one at the Ice House for the other guy. Fuck K Locos, Local Comedy K -Locos. Jam. So out of like, K Locos made it, though, right? K Locos made it. So out of like 22 of them that I shot, three of them made it. So you and, just assumed that everyone was going to fail? Yeah. At that point, everybody kept lying to me. How would you feel if there's a time? You don't know either, right? And you don't know. You're hoping that, and then they tell you a story. Like, yeah, you, HBO you're waiting, is going to be there. And then you blow the room up, and you're waiting for your reel. Yeah. Oh, wait till you get one of those, Lee. Yeah, they don't even give you reels. Wait till, wait till you get a movie, and you want your reel. And they're like, well, you have to wait till the movie gets released. Okay. And then once the movie gets released, you're like, can I get a reel? Uh, you have to wait till it goes to DVD. <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck? You know how many of those things I did that I got the reel from? Zero? After you shoot it, they just stop calling you. Because 10 of them <laughs> were drug dealer yeah. induced. 10 of those things, we were just talking about one I did with porno. Me, Sam Tripoli, Jason, what's his name? Tebow. Tebow. Okay. Duncan. 
Hey, what about that movie you did with Felipe where you're like this sheriff? Oh, my God. How bad was that? I don't know. Like, where were you in that time in life? Were you all crazy coked out or? Oh, yeah. Because you look like a crazy fucking cop in that shit. Look and see what my (laughs) MDB. I I think I was clean by that time. All right. right. I think I was making the transition. Maybe. Maybe not. I'm not sure. That movie was called The Departed. That the other Departed. The fucking director had the worst wig you had ever seen. And I got to be honest with you, I'm no genius. I got left back in the seventh grade. I'm a Cuban that cannot play baseball, so I cannot judge anybody. This guy was the worst fucking director I ever worked with in all my life. It was a Nick Tutorial special. He got these Filipino investors <laughs> that then invested in Felipe Sparza's movie. Uh-huh. With the eye. Yeah. What's the name of that movie that Felipe did? Uh, I'm not like that no more. I'm not like that no more. So look at The Departed. The Departed on my IMDb. Where do you think it was? I'm just saying, 2006, okay. 2007, deported, the deported. That the was deported. The deported. I'll find it. It's on my MDB. So Here it is, 09. 09, yeah, I was clean. Oh, okay. I was clean and sober by then. Yeah, but that movie was, you know, these are movies that I was just shooting them. You, listen. Talk, I, Taco Shop, I, I didn't even think would make it either. And that's a problem that you have. Like yeah. When I shot Spider-Man 2, I knew it was there. that it was there. When I shot basketball, I didn't think I was going to make the cut. No? No, because I didn't know what I was doing. What about Grudge Match? I knew I was going to make the cut. Okay. Like I have to, but then there's movies that... I'm not talking about a studio movie. I'm talking about a movie that you shoot, that people tell you. Like an independent film? The, okay, like last night... The guy, the host at the comedy store, told the story about he got hired as a transsexual, uh, as a tranny, in the thing in the movie, and and it was funny. When I went back, there, I go, I gotta tell you what happened to me. Right after Seinfeld, all the Seinfeld writers got huge deals. If you were a writer on Seinfeld, you got a huge deal, and there was just one guy. Nope, I'm not insulting anybody. I'm just breaking it down so Lee knows the type of guy I'm talking about. He was Jewish, but he was uh, <laughs> white, uh, <clears throat> privileged okay. Jew. Yeah, He had become white. He had forgotten his roots. And he was trying to talk all that Hollywood bullshit. And he wanted to shoot a TV pilot for NBC. They paid me NBC rates and everything. They paid. They didn't give me great money, but they gave me okay money. And to be honest with you, it was the office. Like, I can't tell you how many things I've shot that two years later became huge. We were just two years ahead of its time. Okay. Or they missed a detail or something happened. The showrunner didn't do good or something. Something happened. This was a pretty good show about an office. I forget who the stars were. They called me in to an early shoot, and they shot me out real quick. That was part of the deal when they when I booked the deal, that there was not going to be any overtime. Yeah. That they wanted me to understand it was going to be a 6 a.m. shoot and I'd be out of there by 9. They shot at CBS Redford. And it was the original office. And for the uh, one day for somebody's birthday, the, the original scene was that I came in with a pair of underwear and that they hit me with a cake in the face. <laughs> All right. Now, if I wasn't coked out, I would have never done that. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it paid like $3,000 just for Fuck that morning. Yeah. <clears throat> Plus, I gave a fuck about insurance. And SAG, for I always always worried about <clears throat> SAG insurance. You got to make a certain amount of not they won't fucking. Okay. So when I booked it, like the, when I went to wardrobe to try on the underwear, the writer, the white, the Jew that become a white privileged guy said, you know, it would be very funny if you put makeup on and did this and I'm fucking fuming. I'm like, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't even like dressing up like a woman. Like that shit. Though. Yeah. I don't I'm not, I'm one of those guys that ain't funny to me. I don't play that. When a either. guy plays a dress and comes out, then don't even though that dude special was very good. I forget what his name was where he wore a dress. But the, after the first minute the shock is gone and you gotta wear a dress. Yeah. It's like wearing a fucking uh a Viking shirt to a Raider game. <laughs> and losing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. After you fucking you gotta wear that shirt home. Yeah. So I argued. I had a shit agent. I told my agent, I really don't want to do it. And then they just gave me an ultimatum. They said, either he dresses up or we'll find somebody else. And it was, you know, and it was true. They shot in two hours. But it was one of those things that they dressed me up like a tranny with underwear on <laughs> and high heels. 
And they kept hitting me in the face with a pie. We were crazy. <laughs> Fuck. And after the fucking fourth shot, I had to like call a timeout and go, I hope you guys got it because I'm done. I got it. Like I was in a bad fucking. <laughs> you ready to start fucking and it was like, up. And it was like 2000. Two or three when Seinfeld got Was canceled. it like in your face, dog, or like tossed? No, in my face. This oh. guy kept, and it was like four inches of cake with tons of whipped cream, and they had like 20 cakes. And after the fourth take, I said, guys, it's over. And they're like, no. And I go, listen, that's it. Like, I muscled them like the fucking Chinese did to the mafia. I go, it's over. And they knew. I go, I ain't doing it again. You guys got it. Yeah. That's it. And they cut it. And they kept calling me, bro, every two months, bro, we're going to get picked up. <laughs> and I'm at home cutting chicken heads off. <laughs> I'm doing everything I can for this show not to get picked up. <laughs> Even though I was going to recur in the fucking show at like 9,500 a week or something. Because before uh, they, they shoot the pilot, they tell you, you're going to recur. And they'll give you, and then they're going to pay me 9,200 a week. Fuck. And every week I was going to do a different stunt as a fat dude. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I just did it one time just to get my head together. And that's what I was doing. I was making bad choices just because of the Coke problem. Gotcha. So I wanted, by the time I shot Payaso, I was just sick and tired of hearing Showtime, HBO. Yeah. I had shot, bro, if I tell you how many HBO specials I shot and how many he had, you'd be like floored. Like if I went home and counted them and went through my books, I got to say I shot seven HBO specials with three or four other comics. Wow, and then I, I got picked up. Oh, one in Fresno we shot with this black dude. He had a brother and shit at HBO. My brother's going to hook me up and shit. <laughs> He's friends with Tito Jackson, you know. Oh, he yeah. He knows people. One of those guys <laughs> that the check was light. <clears throat> they tried to put you in a hotel room with somebody else. And yeah. You got to step up to the plate. My bad. I didn't know, you know. I didn't know. you didn't. Yeah, everybody knows. They don't want to fucking, you know, I did all of them. So that was my problem with Piazzo, that. I was just sick and tired, man. Yeah, it was my first ever. Oh, you you guys were excited. <laughs> and, I, and, I, Hell yeah. and I was excited to be there, but deep down inside, what I was going through was such fucking misery. Uh, deep down that inside, I know, fuck. Deep down inside, I was miserable because my comedy wasn't working. The coke and the pills weren't helping it. My relationship at home was kind of starting to slip. I was losing contact with her in a way because yeah, it's the disgust too, the hurt that you put. Yeah, into. it was. It was like I'm, I'm not doing this poor girl any fucking. Yeah, thing. it's like you said when you're all cooked out, you look in the mirror and you really see yourself. It's scary. It's fucking scary, man. And Fuck. Imagine that shit, Lee. Looking at yourself, and yourself is telling you, "Hey, dog, you have black eyes." You're, oh, it's fucking scary. You're unhealthy. So back to the question. Yes. Did you change in the last 20 years? Do you think that you changed as a man? I've completely changed as a man. And like I could see it now. Like I've become a good fucking great father. I'm more responsible. How's your relationship with this? Uh, it's, uh, dude, my kid, my oldest son lives with me. My 19-year-old, he's... He's doing things, and like we always, hey, I talk to my kids at least every other day, or like I go visit them. Me and my daughter are real close. It's, hey, bro, it's like super continuous action. I see you look good. You look healthy. You Thank know. you. Yeah, dog. I'm I see you doing spots, and it's crazy how, you know, people, I got an opportunity now. You know, I got this Netflix thing coming out. Congrats, my I boy. Got an opportunity. And again, I feel like, you know, I didn't do the <laughs> job, but it doesn't matter. I'm proud that Netflix gave me the opportunity, and hopefully I, I'm going to put this no this tunnel rat tour together, and I'm going to use all you guys. Thank because, you, brother. You know, people reach out to me all the time. Like whenever I'm going to get close to Irvine, I start getting those weird emails. Whenever you do <laughs> Irvine, Brea, yeah, or Ontario, you get those long lost brothers that call you. That yeah, and it bothers me because if they would have kept in contact with me, it'd be I cool. Always, but they just come hit you up and mm -hmm. they hit you with some line of shit. Me. I like helping the people around me that I see making moves. People, people, Jesus helped those who helped themselves. I've always believed, I got to see you. I'm going to see you. You know, there's people who call me up like, dog, you got to come do my Facebook and shit. Come do my podcast. First thing I do is get off the phone and check their fucking media and stuff. Yeah. If I don't see no podcast shit, you ain't wasting my three hours. Because there's an hour to go down there, an hour to do it, an hour Straight back. up. I can't do it. I can't. There's a lot. You know, I have a kid now. I got to be there at 220. 
My day either ends at 2.20 or at 3.45. Yep. I don't have the time I used to know more. That's it. Tomorrow at 2.20, I got to pick her up tomorrow. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. That's the podcast. I, I, I do three things. I do a meeting, this, that. My day's done. That's why I got to walk around at 6 in the fucking morning. At 6 in the morning, I'm walking around writing stupid shit, making notes. If I go to the coffee shop and catch a breakfast and write notes there, yeah. I try to work out. You always got to do, you got to take care of yourself. You got to work out a little bit. And then, boom, I pick her up. And then I have a little grace time in between and afterward before my spot or another podcast. But I'm always fucking moving, guy. I never, that's why that whole Kavanaugh thing pissed me off. And I wanted to talk to somebody who had been locked up and who was honest. Mm -hmm. Somebody who was very honest who could look me in the eye and say, like, I don't understand. You cannot, if I did something of criminal intent to you that is a cr criminal charge, mm -hmm. And it's still under whatever. You could still do your thing. But you can't come at me now and say that in high school. I yeah, covered your mouth. Yeah, some fucked up shit. I covered your mouth. That started scaring me for a while. Yeah. I didn't cover no women's mouth or nothing like that. But I've done a lot of other I crazy things. I've done some shit too. That you got to sit there and say, when is somebody going to come out and go, <laughs> I did this. I'm waiting for somebody to come out and say I robbed them. Yeah. I'm going to go, this is episode 228. I told the story on the podcast myself. Yeah, we, we used to play this game like, like you know how you ghost ride? You know how you ghost ride your bike? Yeah. We used to do ghost ride the back seat where you just finger bang. And like, if it went, it went. <laughs> Sometimes this girl just grabbed my hand and made me go to town. Like they knew. I'm like, what's up? You guys down? I'm like, you guys down for ghost? For ghost ride finger bang? They're like, fuck it. So they'd open their legs and shit in the back seat of the car, and you can't turn around, and you just got to drive and try to get it in. Who does this? <laughs> we used to do that. You're shit. animals. Why can't you just finger a girl standing in front of her? That's how I want to finger them. When they're standing in front of me, and I can see that monkey, and I can see the look on their face, I got to be fingering somebody backwards, hurt, putting that pressure on my elbow. I'm going to get tennis elbow from fingering a bitch. That's what I need. Can you imagine how you get tennis elbow? I was fingering a chick backwards. What the fuck is wrong with these people? We're going to Cleveland, bitch. Thursday. Hell yeah. Ready to go. We got one show Thursday, two Friday, two Saturday. George, I'm very proud of your success. I'm very Thank proud you. of the change that you made. And I'm happy you made it on the show. And I want to wish everybody a happy fucking Monday. It's your week. Grab your balls, powder your balls, whatever you need to do. Last week was last week. This week is this week. I want to thank George. I want to thank the fucking, uh, flying, the fucking Jew. The flying Jew who's been silent tonight. I want to thank your boy. Give a shout out to his company. That's uh, Biz Woods, B-Z-Z-T Woods. They got the best blunts, pre-roll glass, dog. It's you can see him on fucking Instagram, and, if, and he's got it in stores, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and we'll see him out there. Thank you. All right, I want to thank George Perez. I want to thank the Flying Jew. But most importantly, I want to thank you guys. Hold on one second. Listen, watching football is fun, but it's more entertaining when you got action on the games, all right? Whether it's hoops, college hoops, uh, hockey that's coming. Guys, you've heard me talking about this for weeks, and some of you are still sitting there on the sidelines like a mook waiting for somebody to knock on your door. Whether you're an expert or a rookie, you should be betting at my bookie. If you're the kind of guy that likes to bet a little to win a lot, like playing the numbers on the roulette, you can create a huge parlay. Do you understand me? You pick three teams to win, and if you hit all three of them, you turn a yardstick $100 into $600. There's so much to bet on. Playoff base, I mean, what play? World Series baseball, basketball, hockey. I mean, it's endless. You can be you action every night, but my bookies won't bet. I know you'll be happy with all year. I recommend these guys because I trust them. My bookie has been in business for years. You understand me? Years. They got great online reviews, and their mobile site is easy to use. My bookie is offering a hundred percent bonus for the last time this year. That's right, a hundred percent. What are you talking about, Joey? A hundred percent bonus. Have you been thinking about placing a pick all season, but you haven't manned up yet? Well, it's time to make your move. After Sunday's kickoff, you can kiss that bonus money goodbye. And also make sure to follow Bet My Bookie on Twitter and Instagram. They'll personally respond to every mention and DM. Not to mention they'll give you, they're giving away nearly ten thousand free money to their followers this football season. So be, you'll be the first to know as soon as the new odds and the props are posted. How's that for you? So do me a favor. You know Uncle Joey comes in straight. Log on to my bookie right now. Log on to my bookie right now and don't miss out on your last opportunity to collect the industry's biggest bonus. Use promo code CHURCH. 
You know why? You'll get your first deposit match at 100%. Uh, that's 100%. Use promo code CHURCH. You play, you win, you get paid. That's my bookie. The church is also brought to you by my favorite supplement co company in the world, okay? They got great kettlebells. They got clubs. You know, Aubrey's doing a great job down there. And I, I just did a video for him, my little workout with the club bells and my little kettlebell workout. If you're over 50, listen, on is the way to go. From the, the whey protein shake, the, 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 the Mexican chocolate, to the alpha brain, to the shroom tech immune, to the shroom tech sport. I live off that stuff. You know I live on planes, guys. You go on a plane, they're filthy. People breathing, people feed out. I take eight of those immunes. I walk off the plane coughing like I just ate somebody's monkey. You understand me? Go to audit.com right now and press in church and get 10% off. Deliver right to the house. You don't even have to leave the house. Get some alpha brain in your life. Give it a shot. You've been a little fucking no bots lately. Listen, if you're around a lot of people all day, you want to take the shroom tech immune. If you want a little boost in your performance, take the shroom tech sport. It's got the, the the mushrooms from up in the valley. They spread out in your lungs. I have no fucking ideas. I look like a fucking <laughs> scientist here, but I love on it. They, they're great. They're solid people. They get to your house, and the supplements are tremendous. I can only get you 10% off on the supplements, nothing on the weight side. So go to onit.com right now and press in. Church. All right. Don't forget, Thursday through Sunday, me and George Perez rocking it at fucking Cleveland hilarities. I'm ready to fucking go already. A fry, flyman, slimans, whatever the fuck it is on Friday and tear into a pastrami sandwich, all right? And then in uh, two weeks, November 8th, me and Kate, Kate Quigley kick off the New York Comedy Festival over there and got them on a Thursday night, all right? Tickets are available. You know I love you motherfuckers. Lee Syatt, my little brother, always here, and I want to thank George Perez. Have a great fucking Monday. Tell them all to suck your dick that Uncle Joey sent you. Kick this fucking mule, Lee.